So we're talking about chemical reactions. Uh, we're talking about classifying reactions, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And we really started talking about uh, a specific type of reaction. And really, um, there's kind of two big categories of reactions that pretty much uh, all more specific classifications fall under. And that is uh, double displacement reactions, which is sort of a big category of chemical reactions where we have always kind of two ionic compounds coming together. And always in this situation, it is the positive guys that will switch partners on the other side and make two new uh, ionic compounds. And the double displacement reaction, again, is uh, the big classification of reactions. And there are kind of more specific classifications that fall under double displacement. And these are uh, precipitation reactions. And that means that one of these guys will form a solid or a precipitate as a result of that mixture. Uh, the other one that falls under there, as we'll talk about, is really acid and base reactions or acid-base neutralization reactions. And usually what that means is you're going to basically form some water. Um, all the other sort of reactions we're going to talk about pretty much fall under the redox category as sort of the big umbrella. And that usually involves electrons being transferred. And basically all reactions basically boil down to one of those three things pretty much happening. It is either you made a solid, uh, you made water, or there were some electrons being transferred. So that's really the three main reasons and pretty much what all reactions pretty much boil down to. One of those three things is basically occurring. Um, so we focused, I think last time and started on double displacement reactions and we could use our solubility rules that we looked at to help us decide uh, when we put together two ions, uh, would we expect it to make something that's a solid or make something that's not a solid, I guess, is the other way of looking at it. Uh, things again, like in group one, uh, things that are nitrates, uh, they are soluble in everything. Uh, so if you have a formula that has any of those guys in it, it's always gonna be soluble. And if things are soluble, uh, they are a solution. They get basically the aqueous symbol next to it. They're basically ions floating around in the solution. If things are insoluble, uh, they are typically the guys that will get the solid next to it, which means some type of precipitate has been formed or solid has been formed. And there are certain things that are soluble, uh, but there are some exceptions. So for example, uh, Chlorine, bromine, and iodine, they are soluble in everything except for three exceptions. And that is when, when any of those guys pretty much hooks up with lead, uh, mercury one, or silver, uh, they will become insoluble and make it solid. Just like there are certain things that are typically insoluble that we saw. Uh, but again, if they happen to be hooked up with somebody from, like, say, group one or ammonium as well, uh, they will become soluble. So the solubility rules helps us uh, decide what is going on in terms of the reaction and whether or not we will get a solid that's formed. And we did look at three types of equations uh, that help describe sort of what's happening. So for example, if we had a little uh, lead to nitrate action. Uh, plus some sodium iodide, make a little lead to iodide, plus some uh, sodium nitrate over here, a little balancing action since we're in chemistry class. That'd be good. There we go, a couple of those. So we can use our solubility rules here to help us determine what's going on. When we see nitrate here, we know that it's going to be soluble in everything, so that will get the aqueous symbol next to it. When we look at sodium in the next guy, that's pretty much as far as we need to look. We know anything with sodium and it's going to be soluble. So that's also going to be aqueous. When we look over here, we have I, uh, which is soluble in everything except for silver, lead, and mercury. And in this case, that is lead with it, uh, which means instead of it normally being soluble and aqueous, because it attached their self to lead, we would expect it to be insoluble and a solid being formed. 
And on the last one here, we have sodium and nitrate. Uh, you could really look at either of those and either one will tell you that they're basically gonna be soluble in everything, there's no exceptions. So that would be aqueous. This, uh, as I ran out of room there, is our molecular equation. And we can write another equation, which is referred to as the total ionic equation or complete ionic equation. And this sort of describes really what's happening when these things are in like a beaker, a flask, whatever it may be floating around. So in solution, because lead to nitrate is a strong electrolyte, uh, which are things that completely break apart in solution, we would expect the lead ion to actually be free and floating around. We would also have a couple of the nitrate ions floating around. And again, that two that's here, when we take to the total ionic equation comes in front to indicate basically we have two nitrate ions basically floating around in the solution. Uh, sodium iodide there is also a strong electrolyte, which means it will also break apart and that two gets distributed to everybody behind it as well. So we have a couple of sodium ions floating around and a couple of iodide ions floating around. I'm gonna go underneath this since I ran out of room there. Coming to the other side, uh, we have something that's a solid. So remember that when you have a solution, when you have a solution, you have these ions floating around and if they are ions, they are freely kind of floating around in the solution. But if two of them really are attracted to each other and make a solid, they basically will kind of come out of solution as a solid, probably won't drop down to the bottom there, but basically they're gonna be floating around together. And that means that when we come across anything that is a solid in this type of formula, also anything that is a pure liquid, which won't have ions, and anything that is a weak electrolyte, uh, like some of those weak acids or bases, uh, we do keep them together in this type of uh, formula. We do not break it apart. So we would keep the lead to iodide here uh, together. The sodium nitrate is a strong electrolyte and that will also get broken apart and that too will also get distributed to everybody behind it as well. And that gives us our two nitrates as well. This is again, what is referred to as the total ionic equation or the complete ionic equation. It basically describes what's happening in the solution. And from this equation, we could always find ions that basically are the same on both sides of the arrow. They look exactly the same. And honestly, if you balance everything correctly, like we talked about last time, you should always have really the same number of those ions on each side of the arrow. So that's what we see here. We got a couple of nitrates on the left to match the couple of nitrates there on the right. We also have a couple of uh, sodiums on the left to match the couple of sodiums on the right. Uh, these guys here are again, what are referred to as our spectator ions. Much like the name implies, they are just kind of hanging out watching. They're not really responsible for any of the product that's really being made in this reaction. So in this case, they're not responsible for the solid that's being made. If you have spectator ions where water's being formed, they're not responsible for the water being made. They're really just there to kind of balance out the overall charge of that solution, uh, but they're not gonna make any of the product that's really being made as a result of this reaction. So that's why, we, again, we typically get rid of the spectator ions here. And what we're left with gives us our last type of equation that we talked about, which is a net ionic equation. And the net ionic equation pretty much tells you exactly what's going on uh, in terms of this reaction. And what's really going on in this reaction, again, is that the lead ion is going to go find the iodide ion, or maybe the other way around. And they're gonna to come together to make this yellow solid here. And that is ultimately what is happening in this reaction. And again, it's a solid that's being formed. So again, that is one of the main reasons why a reaction takes place is these two ions wanna to come together basically to make a solid. Question on any of that stuff there? I think we talked about it last time. Yeah. Uh, most people will consider slightly soluble as being more uh, insoluble in most cases. Um, it is kind of what the name implies. Some of it will dissolve, but a good majority of it will probably not dissolve. So most people lean slightly soluble as being more insoluble in most cases. Other questions? <clears throat> yeah. So we finished on an example. So why don't we do these here? Uh, why don't you complete the reactions and balance them? 
And then why don't you also write uh, the total ionic equation and the net ionic equation as well for any of those guys. You can also use your solubility rules there to determine what's going on. Okay, let's take a look and see. So first off, we want to predict what's on the other side of the arrow. Uh, so we do want to sort of identify what type of reaction, and you should be able to recognize this as a double displacement reaction as we have basically two ionic compounds. So pretty much there's no other reaction where if you got two ionic compounds other than it's going to do a double displacement type move. So you should always know that's going to happen. So what that really means, again, is our two positive guys are basically going to switch partners. Now, when you are predicting what goes on the other side of the arrow, you want to just, in this case, take the basic ions that make up each of these things and put them together correctly like you were doing, say, nomenclature. So really, our KCl is K plus and Cl minus. Those are, again, the two ions that make that up. Silver nitrate is a silver ion and a nitrate ion. So once again, we're going to get this switch. So this positive guy will then hook up over here with our negative guy. So ultimately what we're putting together is a plus one minus one situation, uh, which means we should get the correct form of KNO3. That leaves silver to then hook up with the chloride. And once again, here we're taking something that is plus one and minus one and putting it together to get us our correct formula. Once again, we're not gonna worry about the balancing aspect of it before uh, we do anything else. We wanna make sure that we have the correct formulas down. Now that we do, we wanna double check that it is balanced and it happens to actually be balanced. I think in this case, uh, we got one potassium on each side, one nitrate on each side and one silver on each side. I think it's going that way. <laughs> So uh, it is balanced. <laughs> so now that we have it written and it is balanced here, we're going to use our solubility rules to help us decide uh, what everybody else is. So they're nice enough to take care of the front side for us. So we look on the back side here, we see potassium. And really, again, that is as far as you need to look in terms of solubility because it is soluble in everything. So you know it's going to be aqueous, no matter what. You could also look at nitrate in this case, which will tell you basically the same thing. If you look at the solubility rules, it's going to be soluble in everything. Here we, again, we have chloride, which is soluble in everything. But again, there is three exceptions, and silver is one of the exceptions. So instead of being soluble, this is going to be insoluble, and we will get a solid that is formed here and that would be a precipitation reaction, a more specific classification of this one as a solid has been formed. Any questions on that part of it? <clears throat> now that we have our balanced molecular equation, we could write our total ionic equation here. And for that, we're going to, again, break everything apart. This is a strong electrolyte. So pretty much most ionic compounds are strong electrolytes, so they will break apart. Uh, so our KCl will break apart into a K plus and a Cl minus. They both should have charges because they're formulas of ions and hence the name total ionic equation. So you got to have the charges on those ions. The sodium, uh, sodium, the silver nitrate is also a strong electrolyte, which will break apart into a silver ion and a nitrate ion. Coming to the other side, our potassium nitrate will also be a strong electrolyte. So it will break apart into K plus and NO3 minus. And lastly here, as we talked about earlier, this is our solid. So the only way it can be a solid is it stays together. Otherwise it would not be a solid. So we do not break that apart. Any questions on the total ionic equation? Once again, you should have charges on those ions. You also should have the states as you're writing these things, the aqueous, thank you, solids and so forth. We're going to look at our spectator ions at this point. So I got a potassium on the left. I got one on the right. I got me a nitrate there and perhaps a nitrate there. And those are going to be our spectator ions in this case. They're going to cancel out on both sides of the equation. 
And again, that's going to leave us our net ionic equation, uh, which in this case would be our silver ion coming together with our chloride to make this solid, which is always a precipitation reaction. And really, this is essentially what is happening in this reaction is the solid being formed. Any questions on any of those three there? All right, so let's take a look at the uh, bottom one. We're going to take the same approach. Uh, so I see positive and negative, positive and negative. So uh, again, it is going to be a double displacement reaction. We're going to get a switch. Once again here, we want to just take the basic ions of each of these guys. So that is a sodium ion with a plus one charge. That is a sulfide with a minus two charge. That is a calcium with a plus two charge. And that is a chloride with a minus one charge. Once again, it's Cl minus, not Cl2 minus or anything like that. So just Cl minus. And again, we're going to switch partners. So the sodium and the chlorine is going to come together here. So we're putting together it as plus one and minus one, which gives us the correct formula of NaCl. The incorrect formula is Na2Cl2, which is people trying to balance the equation and write the formula at the same time. So once again, you want to make sure you get that formula down first. Same thing over here with our calcium. That's a plus two coming together with a minus two, uh, which is going to give us C, A, and S in this case. Any questions on that one there? <clears throat> Going to our solubility rules here, sodium is soluble in everything, so that's going to be aqueous. What about my calcium sulfide? It is also soluble as well, I believe. So we actually got everybody soluble here. So if we roll through, we should balance the equation at this point. Uh, that would be a two there, and I think that's it. Uh, if we roll through our total ionic equation here, just to see what happens. We will have our 2Na plus plus our sulfide plus our calcium, which will break apart, and our two chlorides. Our sodium chloride will have this two get distributed, so two sodiums, two chlorides, and also our calcium here. I'll just go underneath since I ran out of room. Calcium and our sulfide. Spectator ion in this case is everybody. That cancels, that cancels, that cancels, that cancels, which means no reaction here. Everybody's just swimming around. Yeah, having a good time, relaxing. It's Thursday, just swimming around. Uh, so there's no solid being formed. So there's no reaction. There's no water being formed, no reaction, no electrons being transferred, no reaction. Everybody's just swimming around. Bless you. Any questions on that one there? <clears throat> All right. Questions on how to write total ion equations, net ion equations, identify spectator ions. Let's try one more then. Let's do all three again for this one. So let's do the uh, molecular equation. Let's do the total ionic equation and the net ionic equation in this case. The me, tie, and ni. Put some extra padding up there for the sun so it doesn't come through anymore. <laughs> Pretty good. All right. All right. Let's take a look and see uh, how we're doing. So uh, we got these two guys here. And we got uh, this here, the lead to acetate. All right, so first off, uh, we should hopefully again recognize positive, negative, positive, negative, and it is going to be a double displacement reaction. So we're going to switch partners here. Again, we do not want to worry about the balancing part of it. First, we just want to get the right formula. So really, uh, our first guy is uh, ammonium and sulfate are the two basic ions that make up that first one. The second guy is a lead with a plus two charge and acetate, which has a minus one charge. So these are, again, the basic units that make up each of these things. 
So when we do our double exchange here, our positive here is gonna go over here. So once again, we're putting together only a plus one and a minus one, which gives us the proper formula of NH4C2H3O2. Same thing over here, we're putting together a plus two and a minus two when they come together, which should give us a proper formula of SPBSO4. Again, not concerned about the balancing part until I get the right formulas down. I can't emphasize that enough that people try to do it together and screw up everything else. Any questions on that? <clears throat> now that I do have the right formulas down, I wanna balance it because it's not balanced. We also have what we talked about as well, a couple of polyatomic ions, which might make it easier just to kind of keep those together and balance them that way. Uh, so I'm just going to put a two here because I have two NH4 pluses on the other side. And that gives me two acetates, which is what I need. And actually, in this case, I'm actually balanced at that point. And uh, any questions on that there? Solubility rules here, I see ammonium, which is soluble in everything. So I know that that is going to be aqueous plus the said aqueous in the problem. So that helps too. I have acetate, which is also soluble in everything. So I know that's going to be aqueous. Once again, on this side, I see my ammonium again and my acetate together, which means it's going to be aqueous. And here I have sulfate, which is soluble, except when lead perhaps gets in the mix and we're going to get a solid that's going to form here. So this is gonna be another precipitation reaction as the solid is formed. And that would be our balanced molecular equation. Any questions on that one there? <clears throat> Coming to our total ionic equation now, we're gonna break apart everything that's a strong electrolyte, which is pretty much everybody. So once again, this two is gonna to come to the front when we do this, and that gives us NH4 plus two of them. We have one sulfate as a minus two charge. The lead two acetate will be a lead ion with a plus two charge. And once again, this two will come to the front because we have two of the acetate units or ions. The two in front here will get distributed to both guys behind it as well. So that's going to give us two of the NH4 pluses here and two of our acetates. And again, here, this solid will stay together. So let's go underneath there, PBSO4. Any questions on the total ionic equation here? That means our spectator ions in this case are which things? It is ammonium, right? As we see on both sides and acetate, right? Our, our spectator ions as they're identical on both sides. Once again, as you can see, we balanced it correctly because we have the exact same amount of those guys on each side, which you should always have. That brings us to our net ionic equation, which is really what's happening here. Again, it is the lead ion from our lead to acetate, binding our sulfate from our ammonium sulfate, making uh, this white solid of lead to sulfate in this case. Any questions on any of those steps? Yeah. <clears throat> Clearly you need to be able to write the uh, back end of the reaction, yes. You need to be able to balance it. You need to be able to write the total ionic equation find the spectator ions and write the net ionic equation. Any questions? Probably not. I probably won't mark it off as long as everybody's on the correct side of the arrow. How does that work? Again, I think we might've talked about last time. Yeah, it's really kind of traditional to kind of always go kind of positive thing first and negative thing. That's usually how it's written. And is it technically wrong if you go the other way? It's really not, as long as they're all on the correct side of the arrow. Other questions? All right. There's our lead to iodide, yellow. I saw that the other day. All right. So we're not gonna talk about acids and bases and solutions and really, um, Acid and bases and acid and base reactions are sometimes also referred to, especially when you have a strong acid, 
and a strong base coming together. They're sometimes referred to as acid-base neutralization reactions. And they also fall under the big umbrella of double displacement reactions. So these are, again, double displacement reactions. They are pretty much going to take care of, as I mentioned before, the formation of water. So this is typically what you get as a result of an acid and base coming together, which is why they are called neutralization reactions, because pretty much you make water in this case, and that is what they're called. When we talk about acids, um, what makes something an acid is the ability to basically produce free H plus ions in solution, which are sometimes referred to as protons in acid-base chemistry. And they're referred to as protons in acid-base chemistry because hydrogen has one proton, one electron, how many neutrons? Zero is a good answer to zero is how many neutrons it has. So in order for it to become positively charged, it's gotta lose an electron, which leaves it just a proton. So very commonly, in acid-base chemistry, H plus is referred to as a proton. So also in acid-base chemistry, H plus and H3O plus, which is the hydronium ion, uh, is pretty much interchangeable, both in reactions or equations, also in formulas. I personally use H plus most of the time, but lots of people use H3O plus. So if you're talking about acid and base type stuff, uh, you see H3O plus, you could basically exchange it for H plus and vice versa. It really means really the acid part of the solution. Now, what makes something a base is really kind of a similar ability, but it is the ability to produce free OH minus right around the solution. So something that's able to produce free OH minus the solution is considered a base. <clears throat> And there are strong acids and strong bases, as we might have touched upon last time. But typically, when you take a strong acid and strong base together, for example, uh, an acid and a base will always form what's referred to as a salt and water. A salt is a ionic compound. So it's a positive and negative guy together. And obviously, water is our H2O in this case. It is a double displacement reaction because essentially the acid typically will supply the H plus for the water and the base will typically supply the OH minus. So H plus and OH minus is how we get to the water part. And the other ions basically come together to make the salt part. So that is just usually how this process works. And uh, basically this is the formation of water, which again is one of the three reasons why a reaction takes place. Here's a table, some common acids. And again, these are some strong acids through here. And there's really a sort of a list of strong acids and that's most of them there. So HCl, uh, HNO3, HClO4, H2SO4, HBr, HI. All of these acids are commonly strong acids. That makes them strong electrolytes, which means that if you have any of these acids and you need to write a total ionic equation or net ionic equation, definitely total ionic equation, they should completely break apart into ions. So they'll break apart. Why I mentioned these uh, six or so, which are good ones to remember for this class, next class, whatever class you're taking, um, is you can do sort of the power of deduction there. If you come across something, you can recognize it as an acid, but it's not one of those six. You could probably safely assume that maybe it's a weak acid that's going to happen. And that's important when we're writing these equations because a weak acid, like we got down here, weak acids. Weak acids are weak electrolytes, which means they mainly will stay together and not break apart in solution. And that means if you come across a weak acid, which is a very common weak electrolyte, you should keep it together when you get to the total ionic equation. So again, I think I did a quick example of that last time. You don't break it apart, you keep it together. So you'll get a slightly different end result uh, because that guy is not coming together 
you also will probably not have all the spectator ions canceling out um, or two of them because you got the one guy still staying together. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> here are some common bases. And once again, uh, here's some of our strong bases. I would say strong bases pretty much. Uh, if you head over to the periodic table there, you got like on your lithium, again, your sodium, your potassium, kind of coming this way, hang a right there to calcium, come on down that way. Any of those guys in group one or two on the periodic table that has hydroxide in the formula is probably going to be a strong base. So any of those kind of guys that bundle up with hydroxide will be a strong base. That is why they are called the alkaline metals and alkaline earth metals, because alkaline means basic. So that's where a lot of strong bases come from, uh, group one and two on the periodic table. That means that if you have any of these guys, once again, these are going to be our strong bases. And will be strong electrolytes and will 100% break apart in solutions. So again, if you're doing a total ionic equation, you got one of those guys involved. Uh, you're going to break them apart completely. There are some weak bases. Probably the most common weak base you'll probably come about is NH3. So NH3 is actually a weak base. And you uh, may wonder, well, it doesn't look like it has hydroxide in it. And the answer is it doesn't have hydroxide in it. But what NH3 can actually do is when it's around water, it could actually pull off a hydrogen from water. And when it does so, it will create NH4 plus and OH minus in solution. So through this reaction with water, it's able to actually produce hydroxide in solution. And that's why it's a weak base uh, in that case. <clears throat> and it's a weak base because unlike something like sodium hydroxide, which all it has to do is go for a swim and it will break apart completely and produce a bunch of OH minus really quickly because it has it on board, if you will, with it. Uh, this guy's got to go find some water, do a little bit of reaction and make some hydroxide. So it's not able to produce as much as somebody just going in and is going to break apart and produce hydroxide right off the bat. So uh, again, same deal, any weak acids, weak bases, you should keep together in the total ionic equation. Uh, and again, any strong acids or strong bases should completely break apart. So that brings us to our neutralization reaction here. So if we look at something like this, which is hydrochloric acid, that is a strong acid. That is sodium hydroxide, which is a strong base. And that produces our salt here, which is sodium chloride and our water. Once again, this is a positive negative guy, positive negative. And what's happening is the H plus is coming together with the OH minus. And the Na plus is coming together there with the Cl minus here to switch partners on the other side. So we can also write a total ionic equation for this. And since we have our HCl, that's going to completely break apart into H plus and Cl minus as it's a strong acid, strong electrolyte. Our sodium hydroxide will break apart into a sodium ion and a hydroxide ion. Our sodium chloride will also break apart, Na plus and Cl minus. And water, which is a pure liquid, will stay together as it is covalently bonded. So it's not going to break apart into ions. It's just going to be floating around. In this case, our spectator ions here, chloride and sodium on both sides. Cancel out leaves us the overall reaction that is really happening when we take this strong acid and strong base together is once again, the H plus from the acid is going to find the OH minus from the base. And we are going to make our good friend water, which is a reason why a reaction takes place. You pretty much can write the net ionic equation for any combination of strong acid and strong base you like. That is always what it's going to end up at. It's going to end up at H plus plus OH minus makes water. And that's, again, why it's sometimes referred to as a neutralization reaction because you're making water. Question on that there. Okay. 
Now, in addition to a solid being formed and also a water being formed, sometimes uh, double displacement reactions will actually involve gases that are formed. And as a result of those reactions that take place, and sometimes the gas that is generated uh, happens directly from just the exchange of the ions. In other cases, it's actually a kind of two-step process that occurs. You have the double displacement reaction happening, and then one of the products decides to go through a decomposition reaction and break apart that produces gas. So for example, here, if we take some potassium sulfide and react it with some sulfuric acid, again, it's a double displacement reaction happening here. We will directly make, as a result of that double displacement, a little hydrogen sulfide gas, which nobody wants to smell. And that is a direct gas that has been made as a result of the two ions basically swapping partners. Now, other times, for example, if we take potassium sulfite here, positive negative, positive negative, and sulfuric acid, as a result of the exchange, we make this guy right here, which is H2SO3. I believe that's sulfurous acid. Sulfurous acid actually will then go through a reaction known as a decomposition reaction pretty quickly, and it will produce some SO2 gas as a result of it. Probably the most common one that you're familiar with, maybe I've seen, take a little acid, maybe some sodium carbonate or sodium bicarbonate, if you like. It's going to do a little double displacement action here. And we will get some H2CO3 and a little NaCl in this particular case. And, okay, so... As a result of this, uh, we will form this guy, which is very similar here to sulfurous acid. It's another sort of weak acid that will go through a decomposition reaction. And that was my two that I needed there. There we go. And at that point, uh, put my two and my two. There you go. Now I got my twos in the right spots. Uh, it'll go through a decomposition reaction and make H2O and some CO2 gas here. So that's a very common one. Some carbonic acid doesn't stay very long. It will basically break apart into CO2 gas, kind of like pop, pop, fizz, fizz, Alka-Seltzer kind of deal. Yeah. You put it in there and you start to see all the bubbles starting to form. That's the CO2 sort of happening as this guy goes through this decomposition reaction. So sometimes a double displacement reaction will generate a gas. Uh, obviously, if you have a gas that's being generated, uh, you do not obviously break it apart when you get to like a total ionic equation or anything like that as well. Uh, and it can be a direct sort of gas making or an indirect one as a result of a decomposition reaction that occurs. So here's a table that kind of walks you through the common scenarios where a gas might be formed. Uh, if you have a metal with sulfur and a metal with hydrogen sulfide, uh, you will get this hydrogen sulfide gas made directly. You make any of these guys here, they're going to go through a secondary reaction that will decompose and make those gases. Ammonium hydroxide will basically decompose into ammonia. That's uh, This is basically the version of ammonia we use for liquid version or aqueous version of ammonia gas because we can put it in there and it will start to kind of decompose and create ammonia gas and you can conveniently dump it out in a dropper bottle and with water. Any questions on gas producing double displacement reactions? All right, any questions on any double displacement reactions? <clears throat> so once again, double displacement reactions covers the water, the solid, more specific classifications, precipitation, and acid-base reactions. The next big umbrella of reactions we're gonna talk about are redox reactions. And let's just talk a little bit about redox here, just so we're on the same page. So the big classification of pretty much every other reaction is going to be redox reactions. And redox stands for oxidation and reduction. And they always happen together. So if something gets oxidized, there should be something that gets reduced. And frankly, there are many definitions of oxidation and reduction, but the one commonly we use here in general chemistry is something that loses electrons. 
And for reduction, it is something that gains electrons. Some people remember this as Leo the lion goes grr, loss of electrons, oxidation, gaining of electrons, reduction. Some people are fond of the oil rig. Oxidizing is losing, reducing is gaining. You can put Leo the lion on the oil rig. He goes grr, you don't have to choose. You can just use them all as well. So a couple of other definitions, as we will see, involves oxygen and hydrogen. And in a lot of cases, we use those definitions more in like organic chemistry where we're dealing with non-metals. Uh, so just give you those definitions as well. Another couple definitions of oxidation that we probably won't use all that much here uh, in this class is uh, when something gains oxygen as it goes from the reactant side to the product side. And when something loses hydrogen as it goes from the reactant side to the product side. So those are really three definitions of oxidation, something that loses electrons, something that gains oxygen, something that loses hydrogen. Same thing with reduction, uh, has basically the opposite uh, sort of definition there. That is something that will lose oxygen as it goes from reactants to products, something that gains hydrogen as it goes from reactants to product. So these definitions here, as I mentioned, is very commonly used, especially when you have non-metal and non-metals together. It allows you not to have to figure out oxidation numbers and stuff really quickly. You could just simply look at it and go, okay, this guy like gained oxygen or lost oxygen as it goes from left to right. For general chemistry purposes and stuff like that, these are really the two definitions of these guys that we uh, basically will see. So let's talk about a couple of things and ways that you can figure out what is being oxidized and what is being reduced. And before we do that, there's a couple other terms that are sometimes used when we talk about oxidation and reduction, which is important. And that is what is known as the oxidizing agent and the reducing agent. Question. The oxidizing agent is the substance that gets reduced. And the reducing agent is actually the substance that gets oxidized. So those are two different things if you are asked what is being oxidized and what is the oxidizing agent, they are actually different things. So if you're talking about the agents, it's kind of opposite of the name. So the thing being the oxidizing agent is getting reduced and the things that are reducing agent is getting oxidized. The reason they are called those things is these things always happen together, which means the oxidizing agent will be the guy getting reduced, which means he's going to gain electrons. The only way it can gain electrons is it has to cause somebody else to be oxidized. So that is why it's referred to as the oxidizing agent. And the reducing agent is a substance that gets oxidized, which means that substance is going to give away its electrons, which means somebody else is going to have to accept the electrons, and that's going to cause them to be reduced. So that is why sort of those guys are opposite of the names. Yeah. RTP, uh, reactants to products in the equation, yeah. <clears throat> Other questions? All right, so let's talk about how we can figure out if something is being oxidized or something is being reduced. There's a really sort of simple way to figure it out, and that is uh, everybody's favorite number line situation. So on a number line, there's zero, I think, and then there's positive numbers, I think, to the right, negative numbers to the left. I think that's how that still goes. And let's talk about if somebody gets oxidized, will they become more positive or more negative? So if they get oxidized and lose electrons, should they become more positive or more negative? They should become more positive, right? Because they now have more protons than electrons, right? So more positive guys than negative guys. So if you look at what is referred to as the oxidation number, our state, which is kind of like the charge, not exactly, but the oxidation state of an element on the left-hand side of the arrow to the right-hand side of the arrow, 
and you literally just see it moving in this direction, which is becoming more positive, then that substance is going through oxidation. Now, if somebody is getting reduced, they are gaining electrons, which means they now have more electrons than they started with. And that means that they now are going to be more negative because they have more electrons than they do protons. And you could also do that on the number line. If you have somebody that is moving in this direction on the number line, that guy is going through reduction. So by simply looking at the oxidation numbers of everybody on the left-hand side of the arrow to the right-hand side of the arrow, and as we will soon talk about how to obviously assign oxidation numbers, um, you could really figure out who's being oxidized and who's being reduced. So for example, if I have something like this, sodium plus some chlorine making a little sodium chloride, right? Do a little balancing like a good chemistry person. There we go. All right, so if we think about oxidation numbers or charges of everybody over here, I got sodium by itself, does it have a charge? The answer is no, it is no charge, right? Things only get charges when they start to combine. And in this case, that's sodium by itself. Lonely, no charge, yes. Maybe not so lonely. But chlorine here also is naturally how it comes uncombined, will have basically no charge. When those two guys come together on the other side, that is when they have charges, right? That's an ionic compound. And our sodium here is going to be plus one, right? And our chlorine here is going to be minus one. So if we take our number line approach here, and we look at sodium, on the left-hand side, sodium is starting at zero. And it's ending on the right-hand side at plus one. It is moving in the positive direction which means sodium here is going through oxidation in this case. By default, by the way, since this always occurs together, if you could figure out one of them, by default, that means chlorine must be going through reduction. And you can still do it for chlorine if you like. Chlorine started at zero, right, it's on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, it ended at minus one, which means it is moving in that direction there, becoming more negative and going through reduction. So it does work for either one, but the good news is it always happens together. So as long as you identify one correctly, the other substance has to be doing the opposite sort of thing. Question on that there. That would mean in this particular example, which one is the reducing agent? The reducing agent is the substance that is being oxidized. So this guy here would be our reducing agent as it is being oxidized. And our oxidizing agent in this case would be the chlorine in this case, right? As it is the substance that is being reduced. By the way, that makes sense because that is a metal, right? Sodium and metals typically do what? They lose electrons, especially when they're near a non-metal, which usually will gain electrons. It's a no-brainer when you have a metal and a non-metal like this, because the metal should always be the one losing electrons. So the metal should always be the one that's being oxidized. The non-metal should always be the one that's being reduced. And that works really well for ionic compounds, because that's always what's going to happen because of their periodic trends. But you may not always have a metal and a non-metal together. Maybe you're looking at something like, say, Iron three on one side of the arrow going to iron two on the other side. Is this iron three being oxidized or reduced in this case? It is a 50-50 shot. So let's see, we could use our number line here to figure it out. On the left-hand side, iron is plus three, which is like over here is shh. And on the other side there, it is plus two, which means it's actually moving that way, right? Towards the negative way, which means it's actually going through reduction, yeah? So this guy is actually being reduced in this case. And again, just by simply following the charges and throwing an arrow one way or the other, you could very quickly 
sort of determine if it's being oxidized or reduced. Question on that there. <clears throat> All right. So then let's get into some of this. So if we look at uh, oxidation reduction reactions, if we take something like magnesium and react it with oxygen in the air, perhaps maybe you've done this before or seen it done before, I guess, maybe. Is it easier when somebody takes a magnesium ribbon and a Bunsen burner and tells you to observe what happens, but don't look directly at it as it's burning? It's super bright. I did it the other day and I looked at it and not smart, uh, but it was very, very bright. Uh, but it, this white solid here is the magnesium oxide that actually forms. So if we again look at what's happening here, we have magnesium that has no charge by itself. We have O2 that has basically no charge by itself. Again, when our magnesium and oxygen come together on the right-hand side of the arrow, that is where our magnesium gets plus two and our oxygen gets minus two in this case. And again, if you weren't sure, you can use this to help you. Magnesium is starting at zero on the left, ending at plus two, like we would expect in this case, and it is becoming more positive. And again, it is being oxidized in this case. That means that the oxygen here is being reduced and we could do the same thing for the oxygen, once again, starting at zero and ending at minus two, uh, heading in that direction, which means it's being reduced. So once again, here, our metal, like we would expect, gonna be oxidized in this combination of metal and non-metal coming together. And that would mean, in this case, our magnesium is our reducing agent. And our oxygen is our oxidizing agent in this case. By the way, the things that are being oxidized and the things that are being reduced along with the oxidizing agent and the reducing agent are found always on the left-hand side of the arrow. So they're always reactants is where you identify those guys from. Now, we can write what is referred to as half reactions that describe what is happening in this case. And if we look at this, Magnesium is basically going from zero to plus two. So it is losing electrons. And this is what is referred to as the oxidation half reaction. And we know it's the oxidation half reaction because the electrons are always on a product side when it is the oxidation half reaction. It's basically saying that magnesium is giving away these electrons and that's why they're on the product side. By the way, there are four electrons here. Why? Is it four electrons? There is two magnesiums, right? So each magnesium makes a plus two charge, which means it loses two electrons. And since there's two of them, it's gonna be a grand total of four electrons that are gonna be really lost, two from each of the magnesiums. On the other side here, we have the oxygen, which is going to pick up the same four electrons. So it should always be balanced the electrons because whatever electrons somebody loses should be the same amount of electrons as somebody gains. It's the same reasoning here. I have how many oxygens on the left there? Two, O2. So there's really two oxygens. Each oxygen will pick up two electrons. As we even look at the periodic table, oxygen is just two steps away from neon, right? So each oxygen picks up those two electrons, moves them over to neon which is what we talked about with bonding, right? That's really the purpose of it. And we will see the electrons in this type of half reaction where the electrons are a reactant and a reduction one like they're being gained. They are called half reactions because they explain half of what's going on, the oxidation part and the reduction part. And they're also half reactions because frankly, you can add them back together. And whenever you have half reactions like this, before you go to add them back together, so let's just say you started with just kind of like the bare version here of magnesium and a couple of electrons, and you had like oxygen. And a little bit of these guys here. Right. We'll do our four electrons here, actually. And we'll do our two. 
And maybe you had these two half reactions and you're like, all right, I want to add them together before you could ever add any of the half reactions together. A couple of things should always be the electrons always need to be the same in both half reactions. So sometimes before you would add them back together, you might need to multiply one half reaction or maybe both by a common number to get them both to the same number of electrons. So in this case, we would need to multiply everybody in the first reaction by two so that we get to our four electrons so that they balance. The purpose of that is, again, however many electrons somebody loses should be the exact same amount as somebody gains, which means when you add them together, the one thing that should always completely cancel out is the electrons because there's a perfect sort of exchange of electrons that are happening. So when we would go to add these together, anything that's on opposite sides of the arrows in each reaction can cancel or reduce down. Once again, the electrons should always completely cancel out. And at that point, whatever's on the left-hand side of the arrow stays there and whatever's on the right-hand side of the arrow stays there. And that will give us our two magnesiums plus our oxygen. We'll go to, I'll go underneath. These are two ions that will come together to make basically our ionic compound. And we'll get our two magnesium oxide in this case. So in basic, simple redox sort of reactions like these where you have half reactions and you need to add them back together, that is definitely one thing that you want to make sure of is you should have the exact same number of electrons in each of them. If you start out with balanced equations, you'll probably end up with the right number of electrons, but sometimes you may not. So when you multiply by those common numbers, it'll kind of balance everything up for you in terms of that. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> And uh, this is in a very common example of a redox reaction to take place. You'll do some of this in 200B if you take 200B. Uh, but this is basically electrons being transferred, which is the basis of redox reactions. And when we have a sort of solution and we have something that's solid in there and it's reacting, where the ions are, are always in the solution. So inside the solution there floating around is basically where the ions are. Anything that's a solid is much like it says, a solid. And what happens is as somebody loses electrons, the metal from the solid jumps off and goes for a swim. And as they lose those electrons, they then become ions. So they're able to be positively charged and floating around in the solution. Those electrons have to go somewhere. They go to the guys floating around in the solution, those ions, which gain the electrons and jump out of solution, which is why you will see some discoloration of this big metal that's sitting in there. It's all those metal ions jumping out of the water part there, the liquid part, onto the solid. And then you have the solution itself also perhaps changing color as all those guys jump off of the metal into the solution. So for example here, if this was a, a copper solution, the actual solution may start blue and get lighter as all those copper ions jump out of solution or vice versa. It may get darker blue as they jump into the solution of copper was the metal that you put in there. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> so we take a look at this here. We have zinc uh, plus some copper to sulfate, uh, make some zinc to zinc sulfate and some copper. This is a type of reaction which is referred to as a single replacement reaction, which is a more specific classification of a redox reaction. Now you might remember single replacement reactions when we did that experiment where I did all the test tubes in the fume hood with the different layers and the halogens. Those were all single replacement reactions. And what happens in a single replacement reaction is you typically have something by itself that has no charge, a metal or a non-metal, and you have an ionic compound. So that is definitely how you recognize it as a single replacement reaction. Unlike a double displacement reaction where you have two ionic compounds, here you have some type of element by itself and a ionic compound. If this was a metal, for example, it will come in and kick out the positive guy and we'll make a new ionic compound where it will gain a charge. And that guy that gets kicked out will come out with no charge. 
much like we did with that experiment I was talking about, you could also have a non-metal that will come in and kick out the negative guy. Why does the metal kick out the positive guy and the non-metal kicks out the negative guy? Metals typically make what type of charge? Positive charges, yes. So when it comes in to gain a charge, it needs to hook up with a negative guy, right? So that's why it kicks out the positive guy. And non-metals typically make a negative charge, which is why when it comes in to gain a charge, it's going to kick out the negative guy so it could bond with the positive guy. So they always kick out sort of the guy that has the similar charge and it will make a new ionic compound and this guy will come out with nothing. If you remember as well, the only way this reaction works is whatever is coming in needs to be more reactive than what is replacing, right? So A in this case needs to be more reactive uh, than what it is replacing. for this reaction to take place. If it is less reactive, then the reaction will not take place. So in this case, our zinc, bless you, is coming in and kicking out the copper. Copper is coming out and we make an ionic compound. This is a single replacement reaction, which is a more specific classification of a redox reaction. Because if we look at what's happening in this case, our zinc is zero in this case in terms of its charge. That is copper two sulfate, which means the copper has a plus two charge. Sulfate has a minus two charge. Zinc on the other side here is with sulfate, which means it has a plus two charge. And sulfate has a minus two charge. And copper by itself has a zero charge. So if we want to figure out what is being oxidized and what is being reduced in this case, we could again go to our handy dandy number line here. And if we look at the zinc in this case, it is starting at zero on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, it is ending at plus two, which means it is moving in the positive direction. That means zinc is being oxidized or reduced. Zinc is being oxidized, yeah. If we look at the copper in this case, the copper is starting at plus two, which is like right here and ending at zero, which is moving in this direction, the negative way, right? Which means the copper here is actually the thing that is being reduced in this case. The oxidizing agent in this case would be the, it would be the copper with the plus two charge is the oxidizing agent. The reducing agent would be actually our solid zinc in this particular case. Any questions on that? How about the sulfate? Is there anything happening with the sulfate? It's minus two on the left and minus two on the right, which means nothing's happening with it. You could actually take this equation and write a reaction like we did with double displacement reactions. So you could actually see what is going on in this case. So if we wrote a total ionic equation for this guy, this would be zinc. It's a solid, so clearly it's gonna stay together. This is going to be copper two sulfate. So it will break apart into a copper two and a sulfate ion. The zinc sulfate will also break apart into ions. And I'll go underneath the copper, which is a solid would stay together. In this particular case, my spectator ion is It is the sulfate on both sides, exactly the same. Nothing's happened to it. It's just hanging out, having a swim, having a good time. So we're going to cancel that out. And we could actually write a net ionic equation for this really redox reaction where it shows really what's happening is this zinc here is going to react with the copper that has a plus two charge and going to make zinc with a plus two charge and our copper with no charge. So essentially what is really happening is this is our redox reaction. It's essentially the zinc is essentially shuttling over a couple of electrons to the copper that has a plus two charge. When the copper with a plus two charge gains those electrons, it becomes reduced. 
and will form solid copper. So if this was in a beaker, we would have originally floating around the copper too. We have our solid zinc and what's gonna happen as a result of this is the zinc will lose electrons and go for a swim into the solution. The copper will gain those electrons and come out over here, probably a solid copper kind of onto the metal that was there in that particular case. So this is an electron transfer, which is a redox reaction, which is the big classification of this type of reaction. It is a more specific classification, which is a single replacement reaction. And again, you can see in that net ionic equation, it's really our zinc going from zero to plus two being oxidized, losing those electrons over to the copper with the plus two charge that's going to gain those two electrons. Any questions?